We have three questions and four minutes. So I'd like to I'd like us to move through those. So please. Just a quickie for Eric uh, about this eschatological life and death. Uh, a point a uh, commentary is that in Japanese traditional samurai culture, the warrior considers himself dead. He's dead already. And that's what permits him to exert so much courage in battle. He has nothing to lose. And that this may have resonated with the kamikaze pilots during World War II. I thought, I thought that might be relevant. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next, please. This is a question for Eric. Um, inadvertently, in your presentation, you helped me out immensely with an essay that I'm writing now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be brief and ask you for a little bit more help. I'm writing about 18th and 19th century architectural ornaments, specifically weather vanes for the Folk Art Museum, mm -hmm. and trying to understand what were originally their acceptable surfaces, which always would have been either very brightly polychromed, black, or gold, and how we live with these objects today, which is that we always want what I would call a variegated surface made up of a mixture now of metal corrosion and um, gilding that's abraded and polychrome that's abraded. And so I had been... In I had been understanding this in a function as a function of distance, basically. The way Ivan was talking about mm -hmm. the um, Greek marbles being painted, that if you have a weather being polychrome far away, it looks wonderful. Close up, it's very garish. And then also about social class, that nobody except maybe Donald Trump would what looks would want what looks like a solid gold horse mm -hmm. in your house. <laughs> and but you bring up a, a fascinating point, which is that we're watching the weather vane, when it's variegated, return to its natural state. And so my question is, has anyone published anything from a psychological perspective about humans being comfortable in Earth, on Earth, a variegated environment, visual environment that we look at, and responding to variegated surfaces in their created environments? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I think... Uh, I don't know if I could give you a, a reference particularly. I mean, uh, I mean, Carolyn has published work that has to do with the relationship of the um, the age value of the object or how we think about um, valuing it. And um, it also makes me think about, this book I keep <laughs> Carolyn and I keep talking about, uh, Patina by uh, Shannon Lee Dodd. Are you going to talk about that today? Yeah, great, cool. Um, so, which is... Uh, as the title suggests, a lot about sort of like thinking about these different um, ways in which the look of the object relates to its history and can cue kinds of associations and relationships and sort of the circulation of objects. Um, so I think that would be a great book to, to look at. It's very, um, uh, it invites a lot of interpretation. It leaves a lot of questions open, but it gives good materials to, to think with. Um, and that's so neat that you're doing weather brains. I come from like a centuries old Pennsylvania farming family, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to just very quickly put in a plug for um, work by our works by our next two speakers. Mm -hmm. um, so Professor Honda's oh, book course, on yeah. um, I can't remember what it's called. Alua, Alua of the incomplete, imperfect, and impermanent. Mm -hmm. So we could get and, and yeah, and Eureka's Professor book. Saito, yeah. in both in both of your books on mm -hmm. aesthetics. Quite a bit about this. But I think yeah. hers is more appropriate because it's really focused on yeah. you know, that particular subject. But we will get you that rather than oh. <laughs> really excellent. All right, we have one last question. Um, back here, please. I actually think that Jeffrey sort of covered it and it was to say that I did, uh, sorry, I'll speak up. Um, I think it's really interesting to hear the sort of bridging the ecological with like the, both of you touching on this idea of ecological conservation and how um, art conservation, though it lives in this very contrived world of a museum or within a collector's market, um, is really inescapably part of the same world. So I think that's just something that was really nice to bring out. And I actually don't really have a question. I just want to say thank you for finally bringing our focus to the future of objects mm -hmm. instead of just their past. Um, mm -hmm. I've attended a lot of these um, different seminars, and we've 
been very focused on the history and how conservators function as historians, excavating these complex histories and making sense of them. And I think now we're starting to move toward how conservators shape the future of the objects. And I think most of the most of the people back here are conservators and um, really spend a lot of time thinking about the future of, of the work. Yeah. So I think it's nice to start pushing us in that direction. And then, thanks. And that reminded me of another. Of Building on that, another reference to it that, that is interesting to look at is this recent book by um, Kaylin DeSilvey, Curated Decay. Um, it's it's more about um, you know the built environment and sort of thinking about um, uh, preservation and conservation issues in relation to climate change and, and the built environment. But I think it would be sort of like like Bettina. I think sort of it leaves one with a lot of questions, but uh, it might be valuable. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I really feel like we could keep growing. Um, we're just getting warmed up, but we should take our coffee break, and I want to just thank our speakers. And thank